This video is part of an ongoing series of book reviews from the perspective of the magical philosophy of Philema. In this video, we're looking at the Islamic mystical epic, The Conference of the Birds by Farid Uddin Attar, written in the Persian language about 1187 of the Common Era and translated by Sholay Wolpi in 2017. This is an especially fine rendering into English blank verse Avoiding the unfortunate tendency among other translations, including the Penguin Classics edition of this text, to attempt to translate the poem into English heroic couplets, this style fails to adequately represent the energy and vigor of the Persian original by making the poem's voice sound forced and pedantic in comparison to contemporary spoken English. Wolpe's translation is to be commended for restoring the reader's sense of being immediately addressed by the poet, which is such an important feature of Attar's diction in the Persian original. To understand this poem, it is necessary to adequately grasp the poet's use of the term nafs, sometimes substituted by al analogous words in the poem, and translated in this edition as ego. However, this is a very ambiguous term in common English usage saturated with presumed Protestant Christian social norms that may or may not fit the medieval Islamic historical context of Attar's text. The translator writes, quote, I chose ego to translate nafs because it felt like a word closest in meaning to the inner conceited self, the non-soul. Do not read it as the psychoanalytic ego minted by the 19th century neurologist and father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Here, ego does not equal identity. The term used in this book is our lower self, the upholder of self-righteousness and self-proclaimed truths, unquote. In other words, the translator wants to distinguish between a normative and pejorative meaning of the term ego, arguing that the Sufi concept of the nafs relates uh, at least principally to the latter meaning. The normative sense of the ego is the bare, basic sense of personal psychological identity, of being a normal, socially adjusted person, while the pejorative sense of ego is of an ethically debased lower self at odds with social consensus reality. A person's identification with this allegedly lower self leads to morally undesirable behavior. Therefore, when Attar so the translator is arguing, denigrates the nafs and discusses their potential occultation and even disintegration, the translator reads this as primarily a moral metaphor and not as the phenomenological description of the disruption of one's socially affirmed sense of immediate personal identity. From this point of view, the main point of this poem is to encourage people to be nice. However, I think this interpretation offers an incomplete reading of Attar's much more radical meaning, which concerns the use of specific spiritual exercises within the explicit initiatory contents of the mystical path or tariqa of Sufism to obtain empirical noetic access to an impersonal viewpoint from which the soul, heaven, hell, a personal God, and the whole social world as well as its moral norms are directly and actively known to be illusions falsely interposed between the self and reality. That is what this poem is about. When Attar says to, quote, leave asceticism, forget piety, unquote, I simply propose that he means this literally, keeping in mind that in a medieval Islamic context, initiates did need to retain their exoteric observance of publicly accepted religious norms at the risk of legal prosecution. Um, Mansur al-Halaj was executed, for example. Reading the poem as a mere moral fable is reductive, however genuinely well-intentioned, and conducive to the conservative historical tendency within Islam to domesticate the radically self-critical aspects of its own esotericism and make them palatable to orthodoxy, be that of a modern liberal or anti-modern Islamist variety. Orthodox exoteric Islam's primary criticism of the radical variety of Sufism espoused by Attar would be of its implicit pantheism, in contrast to 
um, its own insistence on the exclusively supernatural and ideal essence of the divine. For Ibn al-Arabi and other important figures of the Sufi tradition, another name for Allah is the reality, meaning the infinity of the physical universe in all of its dimensions, physical as well as the imaginal dimensions accessed by ecstatic visions. The best analogy from a European cultural context would be Spinoza's pantheism, which finds its forebears in both Kabbalistic and Islamic sources, which in turn ultimately derive from certain tendencies of thought found in Aristotle and Stoic physics. Restated in an Islamic context for Sufism, reality is God and God is reality. And therefore, since the, since the human person has reality, we are all divine. <clears throat> Likewise, literally everything can be experienced as an aspect of the unity of the divine. Hence, the poverty of the dervish can be interpreted as an absolute openness to reality, such that the usual limits and boundaries of the experience of the self are annihilated. In the terminology of Ibn al-Arabi, the human being is the viceroy of God within the world. It follows that any desire to escape the cosmos in one's divinely ordained destiny or kismet within it is a false spirituality. Rather, the Sufi utterly abandons themselves to the adventure of a religiously devoted life from, in, and ultimately as God. This final realization is described in the metaphor of the mirror. The mind, or soul, is a mirror in which the light of God is reflected and as the contemplation of this light deepens in intensity, the light, the mirror, and God converge and are seen as being identical. On these frontiers of self-realization, the relationship of Sufism to exoteric Islamic orthodoxy can either break down completely, as in the case of al halaj or in other cases be reaffirmed through a conservative synthesis, as in the writings of al-Ghazali, who insists on the compatibility of Tariqa and Sharia. However, the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition Al-Ghazali allegedly rejects in favor of Sufism, for example in his work The Incoherence of the Philosophers, is also the basis for the philosophical pantheism of the very Sufism he wants to salvage from heretical disrepute, basically by throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Therefore, the price of al-Ghazali's conservative rebranding of Sufism is the rejection of the pantheism of Attar, al-Halaj, and Ibn al-Arabi in favor of the narrow fideism of a supernatural dualism still formally called as uh, Sufism, but where the image of its beloved has lost the universality of the pantheist Sufi vision of the reality. The basic plot of Attar's masterpiece, The Conference of the Birds, is that there is a gathering of different kinds of birds from the whole world, metaphorically representing humanity, who set out on a journey to God. The story of the bird's journey to the divine provides a narrative frame in which Attar inserts copious Sufi teaching stories. Typically, these are about down and out dervishes who are being subjected to the vagaries of all different kinds of love, in search of the annihilation of their nafs and with it absorption in the divine beloved. According to Attar through annihilation, the Persian word is fauna, one obtains baka, the restoration of the soul or return of the sense of self, but now illuminated by the gnosis of its true nature as the divine nothingness. This is depicted at the end of the bird's journey when, quote, the vanished birds, by an act of grace, were returned from annihilation to themselves. They who were now free of their egos were restored to their selves. They traveled from fauna to baka, from annihilation to eternal existence. Unquote. I would restate the last phrase as existence as eternity. For the result of this realization is that human existence is already fully divine and that the supernatural entity called God in the Quran, the Tanakh, and the New Testament is a visionary image of a divine reality that is ultimately non-dual with the human. When the birds finally come face to face with God, the poem declares, quote, They saw the face of Simorg, it's the poem's name for God, but in a reflection. And when they looked closer, they saw the reflection was their own. <clears throat> 
they saw how they themselves were the great Seamorg. When they looked at Seamorg, Seamorg was where they themselves stood. And when they looked at themselves, they saw Seamorg standing there too. And when they looked at both, both were one and the same in every way. Seamorg was them, and they were Seamorg. Have you ever heard such a thing? Unquote. The esoteric mystical path, or tarika, is therefore to maintain oneself in the liminal oscillation between fauna and baka, in thelemic terms between the zero and the two of the zero equals two equation, thereby living as a divine being. The ecstasy of this way of life is represented by the excessive jouissance of the love portrayed in the poem's numerous romantic parables. These stor stories are often queer, although this feature necessarily has a different connotation than the distinctively modern concept of non-heteronormative sexual orientation, a concept foreign to medieval societies. Regardless, there are clearly close thematic affinities between Attar's poem and Alistair Crowley's The Scented Garden of Abdullah, the satirist of Shiraz, deserving of deeper study and reflection. In conclusion, the figurative legend of the Rosicrucian Manifestos portrays the esoteric wisdom of the ancients being transmitted to Western Europe from the Islamic East, in whose bosom the Prisia Theologica had been more successfully preserved over the passage of time. Despite this detail, there's been a significant lack of engagement with culturally Islamic literature within the pedagogies of modern Western magical traditions. The Sufi Tariqa, like Buddhism and Vedanta, has a universalist agenda. Therefore, like Rumi, Attar wrote for genuine seekers after truth of any faith or any philosophy. And on that basis, Thelemic readers are indeed solicited by the text to treat its contents as a metaphor for their path of ma a magical initiation. I read this poem along those lines as being about the ordeal of the abyss, and by extension, how the gradually deepening understanding of the Kabbalistic zero overshadows and informs the whole initiatory career of the magician through all of its stages. I also read the text's recurrent theme of the poverty of the Sufi lover of God as related to the symbolism of the hermit in tarot and to the mysteries of the higher grades of magical and mystical attainment.